Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to this week's episode of the Chasing Dreams podcast. I'm so excited to have this week's guest, uh, Jackie Thomas. So first of all, she is literally the plug. Literally the plug. Literally. Um, but she is also a social entrepreneur and a higher educate higher education student affairs professional. Student affairs professional. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, you're good. Student affairs professional. Um and she is my lovely soul of Sigma Gamera Sorority Incorporated. <laughs> my EIPs are trash, but you know EIP. Yes. Yes, yes. to the good ones. <laughs> to the seasoned. Yeah, so the season with the smoky voices, because oh, hello, listen, old head status is officially pending. Okay, yes, we're almost there. clear. Oh Jesus! <laughs> yes, um, and I want to share a quote from her digital resume. It says, "I am a young professional, social justice participant, higher education enthusiast, and generally a dope human." And I just want to echo everything in that quote. Like, you are such a dope human. So welcome to the podcast, Miss Jackie Thomas. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate course. you in so many ways, but. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I just like to share the story of how we met. I think it speaks to our sisterhood and how our sorority takes sisterhood very seriously not mentioning any other organizations, but ours takes sisterhood very, very seriously. And I remember, so it was my senior year at Tech, uh, Virginia Tech, and I got a face, it was a Facebook message, right? I believe so. <laughs> yeah, and it was like, hey, so uh, I have an interview at Virginia Tech. I was just wondering if I could stay with you for the weekend. And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> And we've been connected since, and I'm so glad that I did. Don't message me now, so what? Listen. No, no, no. Don't do that. Don't I'm not wet behind the ears no more. <laughs> it was it was through another soror. It was through another correct, soror correct. who pointed me in your direction. But I hold yes. up to this day. You are still one of like one of the most sisterly um, sores. And I tell everybody that. And I, t I even told people that in my last place of employment, I was like, Tierra is the most sisterly, like, soror I have met in our organization. There are a lot of good ones. Don't give me a lot of good ones. <laughs> good ones. In terms of somebody who just is genuinely, like, honest, like you would want a sister to be, like, giving, like, you would want a sister to be somebody who holds you accountable, like you want a sister to be or not to be sometimes but like you are the most sisterly if we had an award i would give it to you because yes that is something no headquarters i said no I'm sure. i ain't telling headquarters man but <laughs> is out there it's no, there. for sure and i i genuinely appreciate that because i know first of all you definitely are the plug in general but you are absolutely the plug within our organization. So I know you know so many people. So I don't take those kind of words lightly. Um, and you know, I don't talk about everybody great because everybody isn't great. And I don't want to expend my energy talking about nonsense. Not great individuals. Yeah. Same thing with networks and people I'm affiliated with and things. People I've even gotten money from. If if the the entity is not worth the time, I'm probably not going to mention you in casual conversation. But if I love you and I value you and and you're doing uh, the alignment of intention and impact, I'll talk I'll talk good about you forever. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yes, and it really boils down to like what you focus on will grow. Yes. Yes. Good, bad, or indifferent. So if you focus on the good, more good will come, more good energy, et cetera. Like, I don't, I'm the same way. Like, I'm not going to talk bad about people. I'm not going to talk. Like, you could run me through the dirt and I'm mm. just going to move forward. Like, it's just, it is what it is. I'm going to focus on the people who are there. I'm going to focus on the people who are receptive, who are reciprocative. And that's just what it is. And that's the energy I want back that's exactly who deserves it like why waste your energy on other things but you are one of the sores that i do hold up highly and if anybody asks or needs some of the services that you provide i will politely alley oop and then text you like hey this is coming um <laughs> thank you so much for that 
So I like to start off every interview by asking a very simple question, but what is the dream? The dream for me, I'm, I'm in an interesting phase in my life. So, right, I just turned, well, not just, we, we kind of at the end of the year, but I turned 30 in January and I started to really reflect on where I've been, what I've been doing, the things that I've valued for the last 30 years and what has been motivating me um, consciously for like the last 15. And I realized the dream for me um, within all that reflection has been to be like financially stable and secure. Um, that's like one thing coming from um, that just keep on talking about like where I'm coming from, like coming from a household um, where there was lots of love, but not always a lot of money. Um, I never felt as though I was lacking in anything, but in adulthood and being the responsible party for my own bills, uh, and my own leisure, I want to be comfortable. I want to be financially stable and especially being in the field that I've worked in like human services for the last like eight eight going on nine years, I feel like I should be in a place where the dream means that I'm comfortable. I can pay all my bills, I can save, I can travel when I want. I don't have to count my coins uh, to make it on down to Charlotte to see some of my favorite sores. Um, that is like the dream. I don't want a whole bunch of excess because I am just a giving person and I feel like what I have, other people should have access to, but I wanna be comfortable. The dream as far as like, professionally um it looks like being senior level administration at a university really working in uh, diversity equity inclusion or multicultural student services i want to either be part of the things that make the higher ed experience better um uh for students who are traditionally underrepresented. So that can look a lot of ways. It could be racially, it could be gender, it could be ability, it could be um, non-traditional status, but I realize those are the people I get the most joy out of serving. So I wanna make the situation or the systems better for those students so that we have more long-term success stories related to education and the higher education experience to Maybe it's people of color or it's just black people because I love us. I love us for real. What does my shirt say? Stand with black women. I love us so much. So like professionally, that's my dream. I want to be not just at the tables, but I want to be, I want to be making the table in some cases. If it's not there, I want to be shaking the table in some cases. If the table has just been there and has super glue under it. And like, I want to influence those systems, policies, and institutions to be better places for students who are traditionally underrepresented and sometimes miss like under understood like if you think about psychology all of this stuff is always and we have a uproar of, of practitioners who are giving us culturally based things but like student affairs all of the theories are based off of all of the traditional theories you study are based off of white <laughs> students and it's like they operate differently in white spaces than students of color operate so or underrepresented students or their traditional students. So you're talking about people who are like 18 to 24 and it's like people are coming into education, higher ed at different ages. So that's what professionally looks like. And personally, I just want to be able to dabble in all the things like Tierra didn't know I did makeup and I do anything that's art related. I want to be able to actually do that and buy the material and like just build and create. Um, and that's some of the stuff that I want to do just outside of this. It has nothing to do with nothing to do with social justice, nothing to do with higher education, nothing to do with makes you feel good. Just makes me feel good. Like I like to build stuff. My Halloween costume was Vegeta from Dragon Ball Z and I made my whole armor. Um, had to do some recalculation because I busted up out that joint. I went Super Saiyan, so. Uh, <laughs> but recalculating and calibrating like around art and centering myself around art, the dream would be I could pick up whatever medium I want and just try it. Just try it and see where it goes. And hopefully make some money off of it because that would be nice, but. 
Child, I always want the coin, okay? <laughs> always. But I wanted to acknowledge a couple of things that you mentioned. So one, um, I personally believe that blessings are cyclical. Mm-hmm. And so I'm always willing to give and support and show up for people because I know even if they don't give it back, it's still coming back. Yeah. Like even if that individual isn't the person to give back that blessing, I know the more I give, the more I receive. And that works for me. The more I surprise somebody with $20 for lunch, I don't know. You know what I mean? Um, Hell, I might get it. This happened literally just last week. I got a surprise $100. I said, oh, well, God damn. You got money in your jeans and you're like, hey, you knew you lost it, but it still feels good. <laughs> and it's really one of those things where I don't, I don't know what exactly led to me getting the surprise $100, but I know I've planted enough seeds in this world that when it came to me, I ain't feel guilty. I ain't feel no shit. I was like, damn it. <laughs> I just, because I know I, I make a consistent habit of when I have it, I'm supporting Black-owned businesses. I'm supporting people that I know who are doing phenomenal things. I'm reposting things. I'm donating to, you know. And it's just a level of cyclical cyclical behavior. Okay. Um, And another thing I wanted to point out uh, that I just got hip to last week also. Uh, One of my friends is a psychologist. Mm. That's the PhD route, right? You could get, you could get a PsyD. You could get, it's both, but yes, yes. Not the med school route, but the. Oh, psychology. Yes, yes, yes. Cool. Psychology. Um, a doctor nonetheless, but anyway, uh, but we were talking and I was like, I feel like since I moved back down South, I have been incredibly sensitive to race, racial tension. Oh. And she brought up a concept that I had never even heard of, which I was a, a psychology major in undergrad. So like, I'm familiar with it, with psychology, but I had never heard of this concept and it's called racial battle fatigue. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. And I, when I started looking it up, and I was like, "Yo, this is really what I'm dealing with." Because mm-hmm. I almost passed at the guy at the U- USPS store, um, Not the post office. Don't go postal at the post office. <laughs> it's a whole term for that. <laughs> postal. I did. And let, let me let me tell you why. Okay, <laughs> so I'm a published author. Have been for three years now, which means I've been shipping books for three years now right cool no problem I know how much it costs to ship the books etc whatever right so you know he's like how can I help you I said oh I just wanted to ship this media mail um which any author media mail is cheaper than regular mail always ask for media mail they will not volunteer media um and that's for books cds dvds any form of media cool and so, you know, I just want to ship this media mail, whatever. And so he kind of looks at me and was like, all packages are subject to inspection. Okay. I said, um, can I ask what caused you to say that? And he points to the stamp that he just put on the package. And he's like, I said, but you just placed that on there. So, man, I said, I've been shipping books for three years and no one has ever said those words so I'm just curious what prompted that statement and he was like well this is a policy ma'am and I don't know I can't explain why no one else was following the policy but that's just what it is I said okay sat there whatever cool that's your policy okay logical explanation I don't like the tone but god bless America right exactly in the post office it gets better it gets better so about 10, so he's going through the process, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then he asked his black female coworker to come over. And I said, hmm, see how this goes, right? And he's like, can you explain to this young I said, I, I, I. <laughs> I said, I don't need you to do that. I asked you a question. You answered the question. You answered Conversation's it. over. Got my answer. And he's like, ah. and I'm like, mm, I don't care about any of your dramatics. What we're not going to do is sit here Yes, I made a very clear implication yeah. when I asked my question. You answered it. I dropped it. God bless America. I don't believe your answer, but hearing it from a black female is not going to change how I feel. It's not going and to. And now, I, 
I feel it even more so because you found it necessary to bring a, bring over your black female as if to validate your statement. I don't need none of that. Didn't care to begin with. Didn't really care about the validation of your statement. I think people just realize need to realize like their approach matters, and it's not even what, it's how. It's how. It's how. It's not that I was upset about the information. Hey, people may not have it's been whatever package you want. As long as it gets to where it's going, it is in fact a book. I don't give a damn. It was the tone, the timing, the delivery that all created those connotations. Yeah. And then I'm assuming he was, well, we already know he is not black. He was a white male. He was a white male. Yeah. So these things are, they're so exhausting. That's like the only word. It's like these instances are very exhausting. And that's what I was telling you beforehand. It's like if people are willing to take the journey of figuring out why they are exhausting to us, at least you know pay for the time and the energy because teaching people and bringing them along even that probably exhausted his black co-worker and it's like you're not about to make yourself feel better on the back or the labor of this black woman after you've already offended in your tone me as a black woman I oftentimes wonder though if people do that to us because we look young I don't give a damn what I look like yeah I don't I don't pass it but I realize I'm realizing now that I can say I'm 30 and I tell and people, people don't I was like, it, right? I'm 30. no they don't Just believe me your version of 30 looks like 50 does not mean my version of 30 <laughs> isn't accurate I know but I know that was the thing that I struggled a lot with when I was younger like in my early 20s and mid 20s is like people especially women and older men invalidating my thoughts because I was younger and now when I catch people trying to do this like honey I'm 30 and they're like oh oh you know and then it goes into the caveats of like where my womanhood should be at 30 but it's like leave me the hell alone you don't control anything over here um but I oftentimes wonder how much of people's tone and approach changes when they know your age versus when they perceive like we can't take off race. And I already know that's the first thing I'm I'm like, it's the first thing. It's the first indicator. It's the one thing that we don't have to say about ourselves that in normally gender presentation. Um, but otherwise don't talk to me crazy like children like i'm a child also you shouldn't talk to children that way <laughs> like while we're at it the- but also i first of all i'm knocking i'm 28 years old check your time second of all i am a well-educated and extremely accomplished individual i am sending my book through the book that i published <laughs> okay yeah that's the point where it's like and, and you know about the, what, is, what type of male? What type of male is it? White male. Uh huh. He was a white male. No, 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 not him. I'm talking about the type of male you need to ask for when you're shipping uh, your oh, book. Oh, media male. Yeah. Media male. Like, I had not known that you're supposed to ask for a different, you know, ask yeah. for something, a caveat. Like, that clearly tells us something about your knowledge, at least That's not around the post. <laughs> That's my point. Like, I'm not asking you to do shit, but put this pick, put this book in the mail. Okay. Okay. And just because you have to work through your seemingly retirement, that ain't got shit to do with me, bro. That ain't got shit to do with me. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, it just doesn't. Like, that is not my ministry. Not my ministry. Not the problem I was placed here to solve. It's interesting. It's interesting how the book is always passed to somebody else mm-hmm. of an oppressed identity to validate. And I actually went on this girl. This is such a tangent from the questions, but anyway, well, yeah, we can anyway, get back. I went on a um, I, I went on a tangent on Twitter just this morning, and I was talking about how basically the next time you look at a black woman who's angry like understand life from her vantage point and i was talking about how people are discriminated because they're black people are discriminated because they're a woman and people are discriminated against because they're not straight and being all three is a bitch and uh, yeah because you can be a black woman non-straight but i think there's also the dynamics of being femme 
and like um the femme presenting woman mm. it, it's a different it's a but different there's, there's just this energy in america where it's like yes i'm a minority but i'm not black yes i'm a woman but i'm not black yes i'm black but i'm not a woman yeah i'm a black woman but I ain't gay. You know, it's like we're always trying to find reasons to make ourselves feel better than the next person because the same, and that's why I don't say people of color. Yeah. Because Hispanics and Asians treat black people like they ain't shit too. You, you can, have to sit here. You can say non-black people of color because I think that's that's like more becoming more of a catch-all of like, you're not black, but you are a person of color. Right. You're just not black. And that's so, my point. So when I'm saying things about like black women, I will say black women, not women of color. Because yeah. women of color includes people who don't fuck with black people. Well, yeah, anti blackness is global. It's anti blackness is global and it's not exclusive to people who are not black. <laughs> there are a bunch of people out there who are black who support also, white yeah. supremacy and are anti-black and it's talk about that part too yeah it's it's a it's a it's a lot but that that is the system and the structure of racism right. and it so is. i just went into basically all of the things that kind of lead to why black women walk around with attitude first of all we're tired we're constantly being discriminated against including by people within our own race it, anyways, go follow me on Twitter. I am Tierra Nicole underscore. Yeah. Like it, it's a whole, a whole Twitter, Twitter, but. Twitter. But you know what? I did on Jaden XD podcast this week. Uh, XD was like, "I'm still, I'm still too broke to get off Twitter." And he was like, "All celebrities that got lots of money or people who are out here doing it and living it, um." Uh, are no longer on Twitter and no longer paying these people any uh, mind they paying them dust so I say follow her uh, until it's the point where she's out here doing it so much you don't she she don't got time she don't have time so first of all but I love Twitter I mean Twitter is just such a free space to just say whatever the hell you people love Twitter but you know the people who are out here moving and shaking they don't got time for Twitter that's that's real that's real follow her till she ain't got time for Twitter no more is what I am that part um but yes so my next question <laughs> how I'm have you plugs <laughs> so what plugs and affirmation you will one day not have time <laughs> um so how did you build a powerful network i i feel like with you being the plug which that's just your i'm about to change that in my phone for you but how did you build the network that you have now you know what honestly i've built it by being myself um, I think, I think that has been the biggest thing. I try to authentically show up as myself and the things that I'm passionate about, the things that I can speak, uh, well to, and the things I don't know about, I ask questions from others who know more. And that has been the building of my networks. Now to say like intentionally, it's, it's, just by via like just by proxy of how life works you are in certain spaces like school <laughs> like where you have time and the ability to build networks um and you don't think of them as building networks you're just like i got friends and that's essentially where my network base started i've always uh I am not a collector of friends. I have a friend named Lavana who won't let anybody go. And even my uh, last supervisor, uh, Jack, her name was Jackie too, Jackie Bello, uh, at her wedding party, she had like, uh, at her engagement, it wasn't engagement, it was like the pre-wedding function things. She had about 32 people, huh? Bridal shower? It wasn't, they had like a roast. Her and her husband had a roast, but everybody got an opportunity. And the thing that I came to, I had come to find out by the end of the evening is that Jackie had like 32 best friends. And it's because she's one of those people who collects friends and never want to let them go. Now, I am not that person. I'll let you go if you need to be let go of. But the one thing that I will say, I have been so fortunate to be in places and spaces with people, um, 
who are doing amazing things. And we're just dope individuals to begin with, even before they started doing amazing things. So I've, I've been fortunate to be around people's growth processes and like, as I get older, they get older and seeing where they go. Like a shout out to my friend, Stashawn. He works for um, Universal Music Group out in LA. And I was just having creative blocks last week, um, two weeks ago. And I was just like, yo, stay, hit him up on Facebook. Just like, yo, can I get on your calendar just to talk to you? Because he works in a creative space. He's a strategist for Universal and like has done some really dope campaigns with like Stranger Things. And he's also in that world of like, hey, there are not enough people who are strategists that are people of color to know what audiences might relate to. And he's on the pulse. He just, he's just everything. We don't speak every day um, or even like that frequently, but I know that he's in my network because I've known this man since I was 14, right? Since we got to high school and acting in theater and having the same kind of like creative energy. And he's just, so uh just so dope like go and follow him he stays scheming um sta underscore scheming uh on instagram he that's like one of my favorite the song stay scheming is like my favorite like because i consider myself hood adjacent i do i do i didn't grow up in the hood fair at least you (laughs) said okay and that's that one song that i'm like yeah, he's got it. He's got it. But like, I think building my network and he spoke a lot and poured a lot into me when we spoke. He's like, you've always been this person. You've always been a person of the people. And shout out to my friend Andrews. He works for the FDIC, so I'm not going to throw out all his stuff. But um, he, we had a conversation in January, right before I turned 30. And he's like, you've always been a person of the people. And I think that has grounded me in building a network um, in high school I was the class president. I didn't love being the class president. Don't get me wrong, but I I, got done. Oh, stuff absolutely got done. The biggest thing for me though, was like, I want to make sure that everybody has a great experience and like, making sure that I had to be the leader. I had to be the person who was like doing fundraising, planning our prom, planning our junior prom, our senior events. Um, And I lost my first, (laughs) I lost my first time I ran. I ran my freshman year going into our sophomore year and I lost. And I was like, okay, homegirl, who is running, who is an entrepreneur and I follow her stuff, but she just wasn't executing. Um, and I don't think she necessarily had the people in mind. So I suffer long for the people, but in terms of building my network, it's been me just bringing me to the table. Like, yo, I lost the first time. You see where it went. Give me a shot. Um, put and me that, in, coach. <laughs> yeah, put me in. Like, Rudy, Rudy. Um, <laughs> but, like, that has been the basis of how I've built my network and always, like, treating people with respect along the way. I give you what you give me, but ultimately I like, I give you what you give me, which is like the golden rule, treat others how you want to be treated. But my, my partner and I, my podcast, um, the community university podcast, she has taught me, shout out to Gabby. She's taught me the platinum rule. It's like, um, you don't just treat others how, how you want to be treated. You treat others how they want to be treated. And I always think about how I want to be treated in any relationship. So that has helped me build those networks. I've been at tech and, and that also means like siphon partitioning off who I give that energy to. Right. Cause not everybody is worth my energy. So along the way, I'm not the friend collector, but I am just like, okay, what is your passion? And that's what I started asking people going into networking events now. I don't want to know what you do. I don't want to know where you work because most of the time I do not care or know what you're talking about. Um, somebody just told me that they buy and sell energy and I was like, that's that's interesting, but I, I cannot have an in-depth conversation with you about that. Just tell me what you're passionate about. So leading in with people's passions or what they what their desired outcomes are, allow me to better plug them into the other people or other things or other networks I know. Um, but authentically showing up myself, I think it's also that piece of being a Black woman, femme presenting, um, where people assume a lot about how you're supposed to interact and a lot of times I think people expect 
people expect you to act like the other black lady that they met and it's like I am not that black lady um and I have not had the same lived experiences as that as that black lady um I also I also don't mask that I am black a lot of times people go in and they feel in networking spaces and creating and building a network you have to be um palatable in a certain way and I am me like I'm going to give you the blackity black jack uh, that I came out the vagina as, and I am going to give you all this, like, teacher practitioner stuff that I know, the scholarly shit, but I'm also going to give you the other shit. I love the shirt that you have that says I speak Cardi B and Corinthians. I also throw in, like, and current topics at, at current events and Ta-Nehisi Coates, like, and that's in one of my many uh cover letters it's like when i speak to students i want to be able to speak to them from everything from bible to 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 the block and that that's just how i contextualize and i build my network and making sure that i'm authentic with people um i've had a lot of fortunate experiences to be in spaces and places with people of affluence um people who have um what most people would perceive as nothing but are just so rich and I've gotten something valuable from each of them and hopefully it's a reciprocal relationship and that's why I stay connected is because people feel like they do gain something of value from me um I don't ever want to be in a space where people um where I where people feel like I'm just taking I also want you to feel like I've imparted something or gained something from me um So like building a network means it's a lot of reciprocity. You have to give what you're given, um, that cycle of just like cycle of like what you put out and was the church say, God love a cheerful giver. So I try and be cheerful in everything that I do. And like that, that energy that I think I vibrate with and what I bring to the table oftentimes comes back and it doesn't require me to compromise, um, who I am in any of that uh but it's worked so far i have a pretty robust network of just like dope people and like shouting them out even throughout this like i just know some badass people and because they are badasses i want to be they badass friend I, like my friend just told me the other night she was like yeah i've been taking some doctoral classes and this that, and the third and i was like i always knew you were gonna be my future doctor friend so it is fine like keep up the classes (laughs) keep up with that like they and these are people i've known since i was 12 14 like love it you you popping go do your thing go do your thing but (laughs) and and those people keep me accountable and hold me accountable not in the way that like i think most people view social media like people only put the highlight reels but i have genuinely relationships with people and i am able to tell um People in my network who care about me, like, yo, I'm not well. I'm not mentally well right now. Um, I'm working through and on some things, and some things are working through and on me. Uh, But I think that's the part of building a healthy network and bringing yourself authentically, because you didn't have to build up this straw man uh, that can be easily blown down. They know, hey, you are a blow down bitch sometimes. Sometimes you're a brick house, sometimes you're a blow down. Um, And that that's, I think that's what helps when you when you build network authentically and not all these oh authentic network blah blah blah. It's like no, um, you should be able to receive me at my best and my worst, and I am able to be honest uh, and transparent at my best and my blackity blackest and at my worst when I am not uh, when I'm not sheened. You know how people look dull when they are not. <laughs> Like when I put lotion on this morning, um, like that's, that's the space. I think network building has kind of like that. Those are the elements that have built this like robust network of people that I'm connected to, fortunate to be connected to, and that hopefully feel fortunate to be connected to me. Maybe. I know I do. I'm going to go ahead just in case you needed to hear that, but definitely. (laughs) Um, But I, I, I agree with your sentiment and I, feel the same way like I'm like how am I connected to so many phenomenal humans doing great things on this earth to the extent like everyone who I plan on interviewing for season one like 
these are people I know and talk to and have relationship with. And to just be in, like, to be able to fill an entire season of guests with my personal network is phenomenal to me. And I feel like it causes me to level up. Cause I'm like, if I'm connected to doctors and lawyers and, mm-hmm. and entrepreneurs, like my mama been in business for over 20 years for herself. Like I ain't got no choice. You truly don't. You like, truly don't. <laughs> like literally, like when I tell people too, like, I feel like I was groomed to be an entrepreneur. I was built to be an entrepreneur. So my mother has been an entrepreneur for 20 plus years as an accountant. My father's sister has had her own hair salon for as far as I can remember. My father's father has, was a motivational speaker, and my mother's mother was a, is a writer and has been her whole life. When I tell y'all, like, this is my life, like, I just wish I realized this sooner than I realized <laughs> Well, better late than never. And you know what I've been like reading more frequently is that people who go into entrepreneurial ventures later on in life are actually more successful than those people who start early ventures. So like you got you got the history and the support and the experience behind you now. So So what would you say um has been the benefits or the disadvantages of you being having the connections that you have? Um, I think the benefit is that, especially in a place like Baltimore, the benefit, Baltimore, small Baltimore, is that people who can speak highly of you in a town that is very small helps. Like, having a robust network and having a network that I try and honor and make sure that I bring, like, my full capacity to um, has helped me in that, in that way of like meeting and connecting to others. Uh, other people will oftentimes talk positively about me before I get there. Um, also it, the power of the tongue goes both ways. Uh, if people have not had the best, uh, experience or perception with me and about me, cause like we all have bad days. It's not uncommon for, um, like me to be like, mm, I don't feel like people in today. And normally my not peopling uh, looks like just me being quiet. And for people in a society, I just was listening to a podcast earlier, we're a society that values extroverts. <laughs> and I am good. Like I'm good one-on-one. I'm great small groups, but sometimes in larger groups, I don't always have the energy to expend. Um, when it comes when it comes to uh those type of engagements and because we value extroverts uh in the society people who are always kind of putting themselves out there the person who's just listening sometimes does not uh always rest well with people and that was a 2017 well 2018 goal for me was to listen more and talk less and that has been one of the lessons that um, has taken me the longest to learn, but I'm working on it. But I think that is the two things that my network has like helped me. It's helped me. It's helped me in the fact that my name gets out there. It is, has also hindered me in some cases if the person who is putting my name out there does not care for me. Um, and like, I take that as a challenge. I'm one of them people who uh, most of my best friends uh shout out to Meldrick didn't want to be my friend at first but I will convince you if I like you I'll wear you down also shout out to like some of my mentors I just am one of them people if you tell me I can't which working on um doing things out of spite but if you tell me I can I will so um when when I am faced with like the network not necessarily working in a positive way. It's like, all right, let's hear what you've heard. And I've experienced that in our sorority, things being told about me uh, that are not true or maybe baseless. And when people get to know me and like me taking the conscious effort after not writing them off um, uh, to like get to know them, they're like, oh, you're cool. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I don't. I don't pass humans. I, I try. I tried my best, but um, 
but just being somebody who has good character and good value um, and treats people, again, with that platinum rule, how they want to be treated, not just how I want to be treated. Yeah. So uh, I that- definitely agree, especially with the sentiment about like quiet being problematic in, in the world, because especially like for me, I have resting bitch face. <laughs> quiet. I'm really just sitting there reflect. Like I'm incredibly introverted too. So usually I'm just sitting there reflecting, thinking, listening, you know, et cetera. But because I'm quiet and I'm a black female with rest and bitch face, you assume I have a problem. And really, I might just be thinking about what what I'm eating for lunch, if we're being honest. Like it has most of the time it has very little to do with you unless you said something because i also have a very expressive face so i'm like these eyebrows not exactly yeah these eyebrows get to going sometimes i can't Um, control my face i'm trying it's not i can control it but like i said i think in a space in it we're in a space that values extroverts and extrovert tendencies and oftentimes um, that means being loud, uh, louder in the space, not necessarily loud, but like, you know, you make more noises, your frequency of like posting and talking is that, but sometimes the best, the best, uh, like insights I've been able to offer have been those after I've taken the time to listen just and, and just reflect and really about your response. Yeah. And hear what people are saying so that I can respond in the most, um, the most accurate way um, and the most helpful way, you know, like nobody wants somebody who is just projecting. I want to make sure that I've heard you clearly, but uh, that has been like one of the, one of the hurdles that I've had to kind of jump over in my network is like your network will speak for you, but you can't control the narrative that the network has. Um, So if it's positive, it's positive. If it's negative, it's negative. Um, um, and then it's your job to go out and be like, yo, that's not a representation of me. Like, get to know me. Come come see me. Come sit with me. Fact. I got good stuff cooking. So Fact. hopefully that answered the question. Definitely. No, no, no. It does. Thank you. Uh, so what would you say is your, like, if you had to pick one thing, your number one secret to success, what would it be? Number one secret to success. Uh, two, show up as you, uh, I have two. So one, show up as yourself, (laughs) show up as you, like I am an avid lover of hip hop and you talk about rappers who have had staying, like stability and like lasting ability. It's those who have showed up at themselves at all phases of their lives. Right. So Jay-Z thinking about his career and where it is, it is an anomaly for a 40 something year old rapper. And active and prevalent. Yeah. And a history of like an art form that you're talking about starting in the late seventies, early eighties. Right. So we're talking about less than 50 years. Well, are we going into 50? It, let's say it started in the 80s or so 90s, 2000, 2000. Yeah, less than 50 years as an entire art form. And we, because because hip hop is like everything that is new, that's hot, it's hard to maintain that as you get older. And I think Jay-Z is a great example of how he showed up as himself, where he's at and been successful in each iteration of that on the black jay-z to i got kids and a wife and i'm out here messing up and i am thinking more like or i'm publicly speaking more about how i feel about um issues that affect people like me in different uh, socioeconomic circumstances whatever i think that's important so like one Huh? I was gonna say before we go to number two, but also Oprah is a good example of that as well. Oh yeah. And I remember hearing her speak and she one day she she was answering the question of how did you build your brand? And she's like, I never looked at it as a brand. I just did me. Like I just did what made sense, what felt right, what felt organic. And from there, 
she became the brand of Oprah, but everything she does is authentic to her as an individual. Exactly. And she just found a way to monetize the hell out of being herself and showing up as her. Exactly. I think there's a lane for everybody. And like, if you show up as yourself and don't try and be this cookie cutter, and that's the thing that I, that would be my one critique of young Black professionals. It's like, I think we're striving, we're striving towards what our parents and grandparents told us you had to like adapt to this respectability and to this palatability for white spaces. And it's like, actually, no, you don't. Because those people didn't move the marker enough for you to feel comfortable in your workspace. So now it's your responsibility to actually show up as you, you know, and it's a bunch of 30s, 30 year olds and late, like people in our late 20s, early 30s, mid 30s, who too like Cardi B and who too uh, do go to church and who too like to twerk it up on the weekends. And it's okay to speak about those things within context of your work, but it's okay to bring your whole self because those intersections actually give you a different perspective and you bring that to any environment. Um, that that's definitely huge because like even with me in the motivational speaker space, there when I first got started, I kind of felt like you know, be positive, be uplifting, be encouraging, and et cetera. But what I've learned over the past three years, three and a half years I've had my business is like, one, yes, we need positivity in this world. Yes, we need uh, encouragement, encouragement and motivation. But people want to know that they're not alone in their struggle. Hello. And so the more honest I get, like, for example, when the uh, anniversary of the miscarriage of my twins came, like, there were several people who were like, it, it, it's like, I hate to make it sound like it's along those lines, but like that me too feeling. Like, I've been through that. I've connected with that. Thank you for sharing because it helps people feel heard and valued. And it feels like my struggle was validated because you spoke about yours. And I feel more at peace about it. And that's, and that's the thing where I say extroverts are like, honestly, doing some of the Lord's work in this, um, because not everybody has the capability of sharing those things. Um, you know, it's not in them to, to share those things publicly, but when you do, like you said, it, it makes, it, it gives that feeling of comfort and that feeling of like, I am not alone in this. And I'm so thankful that this person was willing to share. Um, and that's the thing me and my friend Stacia were talking about in terms of like Oprah brand and sharing. It's like, I want to be able to support people in their growth, especially around their social justice practice. And I want to be able to support students and I want to be able to, um, you know, offer some thoughts and ideas out here. But I personally uh, don't want to be the face of anything. And that's the thing that I struggle with. but. I do admire those people um, who are extroverts and who get joy from being in the front. I'll be in the front if I gotta be, but like I quite enjoy being in the back um, and doing logistics and operation. And Terry, you saw that this summer. So I, I especially because a lot of my friends, well. <laughs> a lot of my friends are advocates, especially around things that are so, so, I think, sensitive especially around like mothers and children and pregnancy and like and I know a couple of organizations that support um moms of angels and it's it's just like damn that's a lot that's a lot so I I completely agree and understand like where your story is a testimony let me take it to church it's a testimony and it's well, a well. other people are not able to share for whatever reasons and it's doing something for their healing like your honesty and your willingness to be open because some of us like myself ain't trying to i don't i don't yeah yeah i don't necessarily desire to be a a public figure in that ideal light of like celebrity like i said i just want to be comfortable <laughs> i want to be able to do what i do uh, to support other people's growth and development. And I want to be able to do my art in peace with the materials that are required. Yes. Um, so number two, secret to success. 
number two secret to success so the first one was what bring yourself like yeah. show up authentically yeah. as you um the second one i would say is like genuinely treat others how they want to be treated that platinum rule comes back i think success is about it's never about it's like i would say it's about four to five fifty percent of what you do um the other uh, like you do physically day to day right like people who get into routines and i'm trying to get into like a healthy or lifestyle routine people who make routines that's part of success is like showing up the other part of success is the work that's being done when you're not around and that talks to how you treat people if you're a manager um, of people then it's the work that you've done you know how you treated those people and how they feel about working for you and wanting to spread uh, the message or the good news of whatever you're doing. If you're an employee of one, Noriega said this the other day, he was like, I'm my own business. So I, he's like, I have to make sure that I am treating myself right. He was talking about health. He was like, I had to start treating myself right and making sure that I was putting into me what I desired to see out of me. And that for him was like eating better and not be a fat or whatever. But part of it is just like, treating other people how they want to be treated and, and like being being cool like feeling good in the fact that their good word and their good work will be a re representation and reflection on you so like to me everybody that i have done right by like you said has come back to me tenfold i've i've poured out like when god has poured out blessings for me like i've felt them in return in so many different ways and like even little things I was able to put one of my students who I worked with at Radford at, like over six going on mm, six years ago now six years ago now I'm able to put him as my professional reference after he's been my I've been his like professional grad school all this reference um, and we work in the same field higher education and it's just like I know that when somebody calls D, he is going to be able to speak to me, to me and my character and what I value and my professional style in a way that other people won't because I've I've yoked him up and I've loved on him. <laughs> I've I've given him exactly what what he's needed in his journey as a professional. And I know that like that is gonna be of more value than any um than some of my even supervisors would ever ever be able to speak to my value and, and character. And that's why I'm like habitually grateful and like perpetual, not habitually, perpetually grateful for people like you, honestly, because like I have been fortunate to come across some of the dopest people and hopefully I've left them um, feeling honored and like supported in our friendship and in our relationship enough to where when I am not in the space, I know they can speak highly of me or speak truthfully. Honestly, I don't gotta be highly. You could be like, she be bullshitting, whatever, but speak truthfully to me and my character and that my character when I'm in person and when I show up authentically aligns with that. So be who you are and then treat people how they want to be treated because those two things will lead to success no matter what like it's going to do the work for you for sure and do you have any final thoughts for us as an audience final thoughts okay so big thing that i am that i am um pushing and i've been pushing for the last uh, three years or so is just have the audacity to apply for stuff um audacity has two uh different meanings and i'm gonna make sure i look them up so i can read them verbatim uh to you because that makes a lot of sense you know i love receipts chat you no know, let's let's do that uh i had an opportunity <laughs> to do uh, a ted style talk uh, at umbc in uh, a couple of years ago in 2000 uh 2017 i think it was 17 retriever talks you can go and see them i didn't do well and it's weird because i love to talk uh but 
and I was a competitive public speaker. Shout out to Warwick High School Forensics and Debate Team and Morgan State University Forensics and Debate Team and Tia DeShields, Dr. and Tia DeShields, uh, Reverend uh, Dion Garner for being dope coaches and always challenging me to do public speaking. But public speaking is something I do, but I don't always enjoy because it gives me a lot of anxiety. Um, but the topic that I spoke about at that TED talk was audacity and it's because it's a dual, there are dual meanings. And I realized like as a black young professional woman, there's also a lot of intersection and oftentimes perceived duality, um, of me. So the one, the first definition of audacity is a willingness to take bold risk. And the second one is rude or disrespectful behavior or impudence. Um, and I tell people to lean into the first, uh, the first definition because the perception oftentimes of my intersections lies on the second perception, but a willingness to take full risks. So I would say like, be audacious about what it is that you want. Have the audacity to apply. And I always tell people, if you don't apply for an opportunity or you don't throw your name in a hat for an opportunity, the only person who denied you was you. And I don't want to hear the sad, salt, uh, the sad stories of like what didn't happen. Like apply and apply again and have the audacity, that bold risk taking um, that's needed to be successful. I don't think anybody has ever said, I just sat there and twiddled my thumbs and became successful, especially if you were not born um, as a white male or white female. Just with a silver spoon, because like, it's plenty of, you come from one of the richest black counties in the country. So like people who have all the resources and all the opportunity, but they never take those bold risks to step out of their comfort zone, right? It's like, it, be audacious in your life. Take those risks. Like, literally, be bold. Don't be muted in a, in a world full of color. Why be a pastel? Like, nobody like pastel? <laughs> uh, put on your hot girl summer pants, those neon. And be bold. So my thing is I always have the audacity to apply a lot of my... Um, a lot of like building those networks, even applying for tech. I had to be bold because I didn't have no money because I was working, uh, I was doing an, a year of service with AmeriCorps. I had to ask my line sister, shout out to Shay, who's a lawyer now, um, to like help me pay for my application to grad school. And it was that audacity. And I told her, if you pay, I promise you I will get in, right? I promise you I will get in. And I had the audacity enough to say, yeah, this is mine. And that's the same thing that I encourage like other people to do, especially in success. Have the audacity to claim what is yours. Have the audacity to ask for help if you need it. Um, be Close bold. Closed mouths don't get fed. Closed mouths don't get fed. They do get a lot of time in the bed because most of the time you're just going to be sulking. But like, have that audacity to literally go and get the stuff that you want. We're in an age where, listen, what did they say? Uh, Burger King is selling tacos. Go be Burger King. Have the audacity to try something new. And that's that goes back to like my artistic side. Like I want to be able in my like goal and dream to be able to try anything that I want artistically and see where it leads because normally if I can pick it up I'll make it work so but that's because I am leading into that in an audacious way like if I had the resources I'm gonna try it and art has been a thing that's carried me around my like because has taken me to a lot of different opportunities but in school you got the uh, materials now I'm grown and I need to buy my own so <laughs> But so thank you so much for your your voice in this world, but also on this podcast. And thank you for sharing your thoughts and ideas and just for being a part of my world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> where, you. Where can people find you? So you can find me on Facebook, uh, Jackie Thomas. I may not follow 
back, but you can find me there. I sometimes uh, post. Um, you can also follow me on uh, Instagram at Jackie, J-A-C-K-I-E, low, L-O-W, 6522. Uh, I also have my own podcast, the Community Podcast, with my dope as co-worker Gab, I mean co-host Gabby and partner in this work and that can be found on SoundCloud's uh, Apple Podcasts and Stitcher under the T-H-E come university C-O-M-M plus sign university podcast where we talk about we talk with um, people who work in service about connecting intention to impact and then we also just talk about what it feels like to be a black person a black woman um, involved in the service community in Baltimore and other like landscape similar to this cityscape so if you want to hear more about that um the next episode we have we'll, we'll be dropping uh revolution jams that is a working title but uh music that we listen to to inspire us to get ready to go out and serve our communities and others so we're creating a playlist to go along with that so be on the lookout for that one uh coming soon here for it and it'll actually be out by the time this episode airs so i'm excited i'm already subscribed cannot wait for it to drop into my little bucket for sure yes the last one we talked about transition and what that feels like so yeah, if you want to get deeper insight into uh what has been going on with me or what happens with my like my partner gabby and what we what we just be kicking shit about please go and follow us. We're going to have some dope guests um, coming on soon to talk about things like Mammy uh, Complex in the Workplace and uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, what, is the serv- what is the anatomy of a service person? Because uh, we, we listened to another podcast. I'm going to give her a shout out. My last dime podcast. She, uh, her name is Tremaine Wills. She, um, talked about the heart of a service person and uh you know i just want to have a discussion with her because as we know from captain planet heart was the most useless (laughs) power so what is the actual anatomical structure of a service person if we had to construct our own frankenstein um because it has to be more than heart so Shout out to her, listen to her podcast, finance, uh, finance, like management and tips and stuff like that. I went to high school with her too, another dope person. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we will see you next time. See you next time. Thank you. Of course.